This is Bloomberg Law with June Grosso from Bloomberg Radio. I made it clear I did not agree with the idea of saying the election was stolen and putting out this stuff, which I told the president was bullshit. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to be a part of it. And that's one of the reasons that went into me deciding to leave when I did. Former Attorney General William Barr is just one of a number of lawyers from the Justice Department, the White House, and his own campaign who advised Donald Trump that the 2020 election was not fraudulent. But the former president rejected that advice and looked for outside lawyers who would tell him what he wanted to hear, like John Eastman, Sidney Powell, and Rudy Giuliani. Trump and his attorneys, like John Lauro, have repeatedly said publicly that they're going to use the advice of those outside lawyers as a defense at his trial on charges of attempting to overturn the election. Mr. Trump had the advice of counsel, Mr. Eastman, who was one of the most respected constitutional scholars in the United States, giving him advice and guidance. But the Trump defense team hasn't told the trial judge whether they're going to use that blame the lawyers strategy. So now special counsel Jack Smith is telling Trump, in non-legal terms, to put up or shut up. Joining me is Barbara McQuaid, a professor at the University of Michigan Law School and the former U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan. She's written a column for MSNBC on the consequences of Trump using this defense. Jack Smith, as you write in your column, is asking former President Donald Trump to put his money where his mouth is, or at least to put his documents there. Tell us what it's about. Well, Donald Trump has very publicly hinted that his defense in the case is going to be advice of counsel, that he relied on lawyers like John Eastman and others to tell him what he could do to challenge the election results, and therefore he acted in good faith, and that makes it impossible for the prosecution to prove his guilt. That's fine if he wants to rely on that, but you know, first he has to show he had a legitimate attorney-client privilege with the people he's talking with. So far, 25 different people have asserted attorney-client privilege in the case. So that is not a foregone conclusion <laughs> that he will be able to establish that he had that relationship with all 25 of them, that he relied on their advice in good faith. And if he wants to use this defense, he must waive the attorney-client privilege and turn over all of the documents, memorializing any conversation he had that he relied on, as well as anything that might tend to negate that defense. And so he gets to make a choice. Does he want to preserve his attorney-client privilege? That's fine. But if he does, then he can't use this advice of counsel defense. And on the contrary, if he wants to use the advice of counsel defense, then he can't continue to safeguard the attorney-client privilege of these documents. And so the court has given a discovery cutoff date of December, and Special Counsel Jack Smith has said, that's the time. Which is it? Are you going to use this defense, or are you going to turn over all of the material you previously have said is privileged? Is the special counsel contending that Trump can't use this defense, doesn't meet the qualifications to, to use it? He says, we are not making that argument yet, but I will. I'm not waiving that argument. I can test his ability to use it. But if he uses it, and the court says he can use it, then he must turn over all of those privileged materials, materials to which he's claiming privilege. You can't have it both ways. And so he's got to, at some point, make a decision about whether he's going to use this defense. At that point, I imagine Jack Smith will contest it. But if the defense is allowed to be used, then that means he can't continue to safeguard these materials under the guise of attorney-client privilege. Is the special counsel estimating that this is, you know, 10 documents, 20, hundreds. I mean, is it a vast volume of documents, perhaps? No one really knows. It could be zero. It may be that there's nothing. But there are 25 people who declined to testify or produce documents when subpoenaed to do so by asserting attorney-client privilege. And so I think the time has come to litigate that to find out whether any of them really has an attorney-client privilege. And if he's going to say, I relied on the advice of my attorneys. Well, let's see it. What was the advice? We need to see it. We need to hear it so that prosecutors can rebut that defense. I know in the Sam Bankman Freed trial, the judge there ruled that the defense couldn't refer to advice of counsel in the opening statements, that it would cause too much confusion for the jury, and that if they wanted to raise it later on and introduce evidence about it, they would have to consult him. 
So does the judge make the decision as to whether or not Trump can use the affirmative defense of advice of counsel? Yes, it's sort of a threshold affirmative defense. And so if he can show that he's got a basis for it, he'd have to reveal this privileged material. And then the parties would argue it, litigate it, and the judge would decide whether he gets to tell the jury about this. Now, the jury might still say, I don't think it was reasonable when you got this advice. No one would have relied on this advice as any legitimate thing. But before it even gets to the jury, the judge has to make that gatekeeper decision about whether it's going to come in. And that is based on whether it meets kind of the legal definition that it was privileged, that a privileged relationship was developed, and that Donald Trump relied on it in good faith. You have to make a prima facie showing, you know, some evidence to suggest that this is true before it'll go to the jury. And the concern is, if it is not a legitimate defense, then you don't want to confuse the jury by letting them hear about it without the judge first making that gatekeeper's call. As you mentioned in your column, Trump rejected the advice of White House lawyers, Justice Department lawyers, campaign lawyers in favor of these outside counsel, three of whom have been indicted with him in Georgia. Can he just pick and choose which attorney's advice he wants to follow? Well, the question for a jury, if it gets past that threshold stage, would be to decide whether his reliance on the advice of counsel was reasonable. And so I think this would be evidence that cuts against a finding that it was reasonable. I think William Barr has said this, as has Mark Short, who was counsel to Mike Pence, to say the Justice Department, the White House, his campaign lawyers all said, you cannot do this. And he went looking for another opinion that would satisfy him that he still had a route to victory. And it was, you know, sort of a cockamamie wild theory that he looked for until he found the one that he liked. And so I think the prosecutors would argue that to the extent he relied on that advice, it was not in good faith. From reading the papers, it seemed as if the prosecution was saying that whether or not Trump has to give this information up before the trial date is not addressed in the federal rules of criminal procedure. So it'll be up to the judge to decide. Yes. So there's nothing that really answers this question either way. This is not a defense that gets raised with enough regularity. I imagine that there's a specific rule on it. So, for example, the rules of criminal procedure do say you must give advance notice for an alibi defense or an insanity defense or a public authority defense. And that's because it takes some time for the prosecution to sort of run down those defenses to make sure they've got evidence to rebut them. If you just allow the defendant to assert it in the middle of a trial, it could encourage people to raise it without any real basis, and the government would lack the ability to investigate to try to disprove those defenses. For advice of counsel, the rules are really silent on whether there needs to be advance notice or not. But what Jack Smith is arguing is this is very much like those kinds of defenses, like an alibi defense or an insanity defense, where if you spring it in the middle of trial, it's going to be very difficult for us to investigate this in a way that is thorough and accurate. And so he should be forced to show his hand before trial. They suggest December on this discovery cutoff date so that if he's going to use this defense, they are going to get all of that allegedly privileged material. And if it gets dumped on them in the middle of trial, it would either cause serious delay or an inability to review it all at that stage. This is a really tough decision for the defense, isn't it? Because you have all this material that they have to turn over. Or we assume all this material. But then on the other side, you have a defense that might not work and the judge might not even allow. Yes. And I think that's, you know, this is some of the strategy that occurs pre-trial in cases that are usually kind of outside of public view, but are really interesting questions that lawyers have to decide tactically. I imagine one of the things you'd want to look at is what is the material? How much is there and how damaging is it to the defense? But this really has been, at least in the court of public opinion, the defense raised most frequently that Donald Trump genuinely believed he could do this because he had lawyers telling him he could. And so it seems that he almost has to go with that defense. And if he's going to, he needs to turn over these documents. Now, I suppose he could change his tech and decide that's not his strategy after all. He's got some other defense he's going to use. Or, you know, he's not going to raise any affirmative defense at all and put the government to its proof. But he can't have it both ways. And that's the point that Jack Smith is making in his pleadings. 
sometimes he changes strategies in mid-sentence, so I don't know. <laughs> um, Barbara, I want to turn for a moment to the trial judge, Tanya Chutkin, imposing a partial gag order on Trump barring him from making public statements targeting prosecutors, court staff, potential witnesses, and their testimony. Trump's lawyers say they're going to appeal this partial gag order. Do you think it will survive an appeal? Yes, I do. I mean, a judge has an obligation to ensure that judicial proceedings are protected from prejudicial outside interferences. And, you know, this is not a speculative motion at this point. In their motion papers, the special counsel's office were able to cite very specific things that Donald Trump has said about Jack Smith calling him deranged and his prosecutors calling them thugs, about the judge calling her, you know, a number of names about a radical Obama hack and a biased Trump-hating judge and a number of things. And so they say several reasons. And one is, to avoid tainting the jury pool who is going to be reading this to make sure that they don't have or ordained opinions about the case, to protect witnesses from harassment and threats, which could have a chilling effect on their testimony, and also to protect the safety of everybody involved in the case, the judge, the prosecutors, the witnesses, the jurors. And so for that reason, a limited order, I think, is appropriate. Now, she did, as you say, limit this to publicly targeting witnesses, special counsel, staff, court personnel, their families, witnesses. She did say that he can say whatever he wants about the Biden administration. He can say whatever he wants about the Department of Justice. He can even talk about the case and the charges themselves. He can talk about Washington, D.C., but he can't talk specifically about the individuals involved in the case. Now, she hasn't issued a written order just yet, and the devil is in the details, um, but she definitely expressed her intent, which was to avoid you know, direct attacks on the individuals involved in the case. So we can't expect that Trump will necessarily comply with this order. He hasn't complied with a lot of other orders, although I think he is in compliance on the New York judge's partial gag order in the New York attorney general's case against him. And people say, well, if he doesn't comply, she can always put him in jail. But is there any conceivable scenario where she would jail him? I think only as an absolute last resort. But it, it's going to be tricky for her because I think she almost had an obligation to enter this order in light of her responsibility to protect the proceedings. But then what do you do if he pushes it? And, you know, he's a disruptor. It's what he likes to do. She said she wasn't going to state what the sanctions are until she sees any violation. She's going to assume good faith and compliance. I imagine that most often when you see violations of court orders, you get what's known as progressive discipline. So the first time there's a violation, I imagine she'd bring them in and give them a warning. And then if there's another one, she could impose a fine. But at some point, if he keeps doing it, the ultimate card she has to play is to jail him. And I can't imagine she would do that unless she reaches the complete end of her rope. But if anybody's going to push her there, it's Donald Trump. He does seem to know how to push people's buttons. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Barbara. It's your first time, and I hope you'll come back again. That's Professor Barbara McQuaid of the University of Michigan Law School. Coming up next, the many legal battles of Elon Musk. This is Bloomberg. For $44 billion, Elon Musk got Twitter and a host of legal problems. They range from investigations by the SEC and the FTC to disputes over law firm billing and firing employees. Joining me to sort it all out is business law expert Eric Talley, a professor at Columbia Law School. So I just thought we'd take these one by one. Sure. So the SEC is investigating whether Musk violated security laws in buying Twitter shares ahead of his purchase of the platform. So there is a long-standing rule that if you are interested in buying up a company, you can go for it. But if you start, you know, buying up stock of that company with an intent to take it over or create some other big sort of a change, you have to alert people what you were up to at the time. It was within 10 days of crossing over a specific 5% threshold. By the way, in the last week, that 10-day period has been reduced to five, but it was 10 when Elon Musk was 
beginning his purchases of shares. Now, back in April 2022, he eventually made one of these disclosures saying, I own 9.2% of Twitter, and I'm thinking about buying out the company. But there was not a lot of clarity on what was the path by which he got to 9.2. And in particular, did he cross the 5% threshold well before you know what he said the 10-day clock was when it started ticking. So if he did um, cross 5% and then delayed in filing, he'd be in violation of that federal rule that requires disclosure. So part of uh, what this is all about is to try to figure out whether Musk was you know basically sneaking up in his purchases in a way that's not allowed by federal securities law. Musk has sat for depositions, half-day depositions, twice. But yet the SEC wants him to testify again, it's trying to force him to testify. Shouldn't this be something that they could find an answer to after two depositions? It well, doesn't seem like, that complicated. <laughs> yeah, well, you'd like to think so. But uh, I certainly have seen certain depositions that get very, very complicated in no small part due to the fact that some of it is you know, kind of performative acrobatics by the attorneys as well, you know, fighting over whether this is a, you know, a domain that's proper to be discussed, trying to, you know, sort of fight back against various types of documents that are being put forward. And then in addition, you know, when someone is buying up stock, when you and I buy up stock, you know, June, we probably just like, you know, contact our broker and buy it in our name. But that's not the only way that you can buy stock. You can have various affiliate structures that purchase stock. You can have groups that are coordinating with you to purchase stock at the same time. And so my guess is, and you know, we, none of us have been inside those depositions, but my guess is that's one of the things that they're trying to determine is, is you know, how about these other purchases by these other entities that seem linked to you? How linked are they to you? And so forth. And so Musk has sat for two depositions. Evidently, he was supposed to show up for a third and then, and then didn't show. <laughs> uh, so you know, my guess is that it's sort of a combination of trying to get into the technical nitty gritty of all the different sort of buying entities that might be buying up stock, as well as, you know, what no doubt has to be a fair amount of fireworks going back and forth between the commission's attorneys and Mr. Musk's attorneys. What kind of penalty would there be if they found out that he did violate this? Well, the SEC has a a bunch of different potential penalties available to them. Some of them are quite severe. My guess is that this one wouldn't be hugely severe, but it could involve some sort of a monetary penalty. You know, in extreme cases, you could be precluded from being an officer and director of a company, but this would probably be more in the category of a technical violation that wouldn't give rise to that sort of extreme penalty. So to the extent that there is something, my guess is it'll be some sort of a monetary fine. But, you know, the you know, issue about, you know, sort of tripping up these triggers is increasingly important. Um, and so, you know, in, in some ways, this may be partially an action against against Mr. Musk, but it might also be kind of a warning shot across the bow of other future uh, would-be acquirers, including maybe Mr. Musk himself or some other Mm -hmm. company, about the importance of making sure that you stick to the rules of the road when you start buying up stock. And so this may be in part also, you know, a larger act of messaging by the SEC to the entire public that they're going to take these rules seriously, particularly, you know, as the deadline changed from a 10-day you know, period that you could delay to only five. Now we go from the SEC to the FTC. There seem to be a couple of things going on. Before Musk bought Twitter, Twitter had agreed to pay $150 million to resolve allegations it mishandled user data. Is he trying to get out of that now? Well, this is an interesting uh, sort of an issue that had already cropped up during the period of time when Elon Musk was trying to get out of buying Twitter. So, you know, more than a decade before Musk purchased Twitter, the company, you know, basically was getting scrutinized by the FTC for various types of cybersecurity lapses. And they entered into this consent decree that really basically said that the FTC was going to be able to monitor them on an ongoing basis for whether they have fixed the problem. One of the interesting things about you know the decision to buy Twitter and then the decision uh, not to buy Twitter and to try to get out of the deal is that Mr. Musk, throughout the entire summer of 2022, was looking for any possible reason to be able to walk away from the deal. And so it was a, a high-risk strategy, and you know, I guess he thought it was a high reward, but, but one of these strategies that he was undertaking was to say, 
Oh, cybersecurity issues are a mess at Twitter. I had no idea, notwithstanding the existence of the consent decree. And I'm going to actually further amplify, you know, how bad I think these cybersecurity issues are. And I don't know if you remember, but for this report by Peter Zatko or Mudge, I guess was his <laughs> nom de plume, talking about, you know, all the terrible cybersecurity issues at Twitter. You know, Musk was effectively trying to use that as an excuse or a pretext to walk away from the deal. But then once he had to close on the deal because the prospects did not look good that he was going to win in his attempt to walk away from it, it's sort of a if you break it, you buy it. And it's sort of as though he had spent the summer piling additional attention onto security lapse issues but then ended up, when the smoke cleared, being the owner of Twitter and therefore the owner of all of those potential consequences. And that's, you know, in some ways what has come home to roost right now. Maybe that was always going to happen, but it's almost certain that the attention that Mr. Musk himself was trying to put on Twitter's supposed or alleged cybersecurity problems, you know, ended up attracting even more attention to it. So the FTC has sort of come back in this process. And now, you know, Mr. Musk has somewhat predictably switched sides and said, there's absolutely no security problem at Twitter. This is a locked tight organization. And this is just an attempt by the government to harass Twitter. You know, maybe or maybe not, but the fact of the matter is that he was taking exactly the opposite view before he took over Twitter and then proceeded to lay off a bunch of uh, individuals, including in the, in the cybersecurity department. So that's a difficult argument to do the flip turn on. He's trying to do so. It's not surprising that he's trying to do so, but it becomes kind of a complex argument to try to pull off. Maybe we'll learn more at a hearing that's scheduled for November 16th. So now we move to what's now X. So X has sued Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen, and Katz, the law firm that was brought on to represent Twitter after Musk tried to walk back that deal. And he's suing them over their stunning $90 million in legal fees. But what are the grounds for not paying them? Yeah, I think he's suing them for being an effective law firm. <laughs> Maybe kind of That's a, behind it. <laughs> the front of it. Here's the deal. Firms like Wachtell, they generally don't work on a contingency basis. That is not really the standard model for the white shoe New York law firm. They work on an hourly basis and usually what happens is their clients are willing to sort of, you know, put forward those sorts of hourly fees. I think this was a weird situation because even though a lot of people thought you know, this merger agreement that Mr. Musk has gotten into with Twitter, it's pretty favorable to closing the deal. It's pretty, you know, favorable to Twitter's, you know, refusal to let him walk away. And, you know, Wachtell Lipton was representing Twitter. But even as, you know, a lot of, including myself, a lot of sort of legal experts in this field were thinking, yeah, this is going to be a really hard case for Mr. Musk to win. The general public out there, or the zeitgeist around the deal, was anything but crystal clear. And during the summer, you know, for this deal that was supposed to close at fifty-four dollars and twenty cents per share for Twitter shares, you could go out and buy Twitter shares for thirty-six dollars a share, thirty-eight dollars a share, which you know, in some ways, reflects what a lot of people out there in the markets were thinking. He's going to find a way. He's going to work out some way to either intimidate the judge walk away from the deal and tie this thing up in litigation forever, exhaust the Twitter board, and essentially be able to walk away for a minimal amount of, of money. Coming up, I'll continue this conversation with Eric Talley, and he'll answer the question, is Elon Musk too litigious? I'm June Grosso, and you're listening to Bloomberg. I've been talking to Professor Eric Talley of Columbia Law School about the legal troubles that followed Elon Musk's purchase of Twitter. So, Eric, before the break, we were discussing Elon Musk suing Wachtell over their $90 million legal fee for representing Twitter, which, by the way, has already been paid. Wachtell said in court filings it never agreed to limit the firm's fees to hourly rates. Now, we don't know exactly what went on in the negotiations between Wachtell and Twitter, but it's not a crazy presumption to think that they were you know, basically trying to convince the Twitter board, look, this is a pretty strong case. We think it's a really strong case. We're willing to fight it all the way to the finish line and tell you what, I mean, if you're really worried about it, why don't you just uh, pay us a little bit less in terms of the hourly fee and give us 
you know, a success fee. If we end up closing this thing, you're going to pay more for it. The Twitter board agreed to do that. And indeed, the, the deal ends up closing at exactly $54.20. Now, that ended up giving rise to a, a substantial payment to Wachtell, you know, $90 million. And that's what, you know, Twitter and X and Mr. Musk are now trying to challenge, saying, you know, no law firm gets paid $90 million to fight a lawsuit. And that's not entirely true. Really? Uh, yeah. So it, it turns out that one version of law firms does get paid that kind of money when, when we're dealing with large you know, billion to multi-billion dollar awards. And that's plaintiff side attorney who take cases on a contingency basis as the norm. And so courts have, have definitely had all sorts of experience sort of saying, okay, when a plaintiff side attorney takes a case on a contingency fee, they're bearing a lot of risk. And when they bear a lot of risk and things go well for them, that's going to give rise to something that looks like, you know, a really large award, particularly if you view that and judge it against, you know, what's the usual hourly rate for an attorney. And the reason is that it's kind of like a lottery ticket that paid off, right? And, you know, for every lottery ticket that pays off, they have nine losers, right? And so the idea is that when you take a, a case on a contingency basis, it's almost an immediate signal that this is a risky case. It seems clear from the stock prices at the time that at least people out in the market thought this was a risky case. On the other hand, a lot of legal experts were thinking, oh, this is not that risky of a case. So the pressure was great on the Twitter board, and you know, it, it may well be the case that they kind of wanted that extra assurance from Wachtell that this is something that you're going to be able to, to close on the agreed terms. How does a judge, or in this case an arbitrator, determine the fee? You know, one of the things that happens when judges, you know, are asked to sign off on, say, a big class action award in which tens of millions or hundreds of millions even are being paid to the plaintiff attorneys is they'll say, well, what kind of a value did you create for the beneficiaries that you are, you know, basically representing? So in this case, I guess the question is, what kind of value did you create for the Twitter shareholders who, you know, ended up selling at $54.20 per share? You know, Wachtell's claim on this is, look, if this deal was going to close and if you base your assessment on what the securities market prices were at the time, you know, we made tens of billions of dollars for shareholders by sticking to this uh, litigation strategy and having a compensation structure that kind of bonded us to do that. And so from Wachtell's perspective, they created, you know, more value for, you know, for Twitter shareholders in the history of all, you know, <laughs> legal representation. I should you hope know. so for $90 million. <laughs> Yeah, that's a little bit of a rhetorical flourish, but that's kind of the aim that they're taking. And this is going to be an interesting argument because, you know, I do think that one argument that potentially um, X and Twitter have in their favor is, you know, the question of, well, was there a difference between the public zeitgeist and the public markets we're thinking and what sort of a little bit more of a clear-eyed legal analysis would ask as to what were the likelihoods of success in this case. And if, in fact, a clear-eyed legal analysis suggests, you know, this wasn't really a lottery ticket or, or this is a lottery ticket that was going to pay off with 100% probability, then $90 million looks like a lot of money to be paying for a lottery ticket that you know is going to pay off anyway. And so that's going to be the interesting dispute here because, well, I think most experienced lawyers, law professors, sort of legal informed people were kind of scratching their heads on could Musk really walk away from this deal. That certainly didn't work its way into the market and the people that sort of arbitrage and buy and sell stock. They had definitely not internalized this idea that this was 100% you know, payoff lottery ticket. By my best estimate, the price that Twitter stock was trading at during the litigation was kind of like betting that it was about a 45 to 50 percent likelihood of a payoff. So I think this is going to be a super interesting thing just because the market arbitrageurs were just on a different page than the legal experts. Usually they're on the same page, but this was a kind of a dramatic and in some ways memorable failure of market arbitrageurs to fully understand the nature of the legal claims. So the National Labor Relations Board has filed a formal complaint accusing X of violating federal labor law by firing an employee in retaliation for her internet posts, which challenged the company's return to office policy. Is it unusual for the NLRB to get in involved in this? 
It can be. The, the NLRB routinely gets involved in situations involving retaliatory terminations of employees, but they're almost always more along the rank-and-file employee level. In a lot of these cases involving Twitter, the folks that were you know, basically handed their pink slips ranged from, I guess, some rank-and-file folks to mid-level management to even upper-level management. So it's a little bit more peculiar that the NLRB would be getting involved on behalf of sort of upper-level and mid-level managers, but there's nothing that's inconsistent with their regulatory mandate in doing that. And this is one of many cases uh, that in this particular case, the employee, you know, was basically getting on social media and sending the message to some of her coworkers that, uh, look, your rights are going to be far greater if you get fired than <laughs> if you resign. And, and that's, that's true. true. <laughs> that's absolutely true. That can be frustrating because if people would just resign on their own accord, that's going to really limit how much you're going to have to owe them. If you now fire them and they have various types of protections in their contract, either protections that are explicitly written into them or are implicitly part of them as part of federal labor laws, then it can get more expensive and certainly give rise to more litigation. And so that, that's going to be another interesting thing, not just with this case, but with several dozen others that are you know, at various stages of dispute. Even before he became president, Donald Trump was known for being very litigious in business. Is Elon Musk similarly litigious? Well, he definitely has shown an ability to say, I'm going to hold out and try to fight in court. And he's been in the courthouse in many disputes over the last year, and his track record isn't that bad. Most people would say that the closing of the Twitter purchase basically reflected a, a, a loss. It wasn't a, you know an opinion that went against him, but I think everyone expected that that's what's going to happen, and that's why they just closed the deal. But, you know, in other situations, say, involving his compensation, involving, you know, his tweet about, you know, taking private decisions for Tesla, he's actually succeeded. So I think that he has definitely put himself in the realm of someone who is willing to fight. And the question is, is he too willing to fight, even to the point where he's throwing good money after bad? You know, I think a lot of people sort of think the Twitter acquisition, you know, particularly if this $90 million payment to Wachtell is upheld, certainly is, is one of the things that you would put in the category of it's possible to be too pugnacious and too litigious and then having to pay much more just for um, your you know attempts to fight than uh, would have been worth it on any sensible basis. But, you know, I think it is a fair, a fair assessment of him to conclude that where many other types of CEOs and entrepreneurs and, you know, large market capitalists would tend to have a slightly risk-averse view about getting dragged into litigation, he's not quite as risk averse and maybe even a little bit risk preferring. He certainly has the legal cases to prove that. Thanks so much, Eric, as always. That's Eric Talley, a professor at Columbia Law School. And that's it for this edition of the Bloomberg Law Show. Remember, you can always get the latest legal news on our Bloomberg Law podcast. You can find them on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and at www.bloomberg.com slash podcast slash law. And remember to tune into the Bloomberg Law Show every weeknight at 10 p.m. Wall Street time. I'm June Grosso, and you're listening to Bloomberg.